Okay, thank you. And uh, thanks to the uh, organizers for the invitation and for arranging this very nice series of lectures. I'm going to talk about some new joint work with Matt Roberts that involves using branching Brownian motion with an inhomogeneous branching rate to model certain populations undergoing selection. I'll begin by describing a discrete population model that motivated this work. Then I'll introduce the branching Brownian motion process that we're going to study. I will next introduce some heuristics based on large deviations that will help us to predict the behavior of our branching Brownian motion process. Then I'll describe some of the main tools that we use to establish rigorous results for this process. And finally, I'll state our main results and indicate some directions for future work. So uh, in uh, populations involving selection, we think of each individual as having a certain fitness level and individuals can acquire beneficial mutations which increase their fitness. I've indicated here uh, one example of a population model that incorporates selection. Other authors formulate the model slightly differently and these differences won't be important for our purposes. So let's say the population has fixed size n, so there are always n individuals in the population. We'll assume that each individual independently acquires mutations at times of a Poisson process of rate mu sub n, and all the mutations are beneficial. And we model this by saying that an individual with j mutations at time t, which I'll call a type j individual, has fitness one plus sn, times j minus m of t, where m of t represents the average number of mutations of the individuals in the population at time t. So if an individual has three more mutations than average, its fitness is one plus three times sn. So the parameter sn is measuring the fitness benefit that an individual gets from a mutation. As in the classical Morin model, we'll assume that each individual independently lives for an exponentially distributed time with rate one. When an individual dies, a new individual is born, and we choose an individual at random from the population with probability proportional to fitness to be the parent of the new individual. So fitter individuals are more likely to have offspring, and the new individual inherits the same type as the parent. Now in uh, models like this, it's natural to ask how the distribution of the fitness levels of individuals in the population evolves over time. And there are a number of papers in the biology literature that consider this question. And they have generally come to the conclusion that under a wide range of circumstances, the fitness distribution evolves like a Gaussian traveling wave. That is, let's say at some time T1, we record the fitness level of every individual in the population and plot those numbers in a histogram. And then we should see a uh, Gaussian distribution as pictured here. But then over time, as the population evolves, the fitness of the population increases so that at some later time T2, the fitness distribution may be over here. And so we see this Gaussian traveling wave where the mean of the Gaussian distribution is moving ahead at constant speed. Now the idea of modeling the evolution of the fitness distribution by a traveling wave goes back at least to this 1996 paper of Simring, Levine, and Kessler. Uh, these uh, more recent papers also derived the Gaussian shape for the fitness distribution. But while several of these papers were very detailed and sophisticated, they were not written in a mathematically rigorous way. So what's known rigorously about this model? Well, let's first consider the case in which the mutation rate is very slow. So let's suppose the mutation rate is much smaller than one over n log n, and the uh, fitness advantage that one gets from a mutation is some fixed positive constant that does not tend to zero with n. So in this case, when a beneficial mutation occurs, most likely it either quickly dies out or it spreads to the entire population before another beneficial mutation appears, which is an event known as a selective sweep. And so at a typical time, 
there will be no more than one beneficial mutation in the population that has not already spread to the entire population. Now, Durrett and Mayberry considered the case in which the mutation rate behaves like n to the power minus beta, where beta is between 0 and 1. And they did rigorously establish traveling wave behavior. However, these mutation rates are still sufficiently small that the number of distinct types present in the population at a given time is a constant that does not tend to infinity with n. So they were not really able to observe a Gaussian shape for the distribution of fitnesses. In 2017, I considered somewhat faster mutation rates. This work covered the case in which the mutation rate behaved like e to the minus log n to the power c, where c is between 1 half and 1. And the selective advantage Sn uh, tends to 0 with n, but much more slowly than the mutation rate. So this work essentially made rigorous the analysis in this paper of Desai and Fisher. And for these parameter values, one can show that the fitness distribution has Gaussian-like tails in the sense that the proportion of individuals that have k more mutations than average or k fewer mutations than average behaves like e to the minus a constant times k squared. However, it also happens that the proportion of individuals uh, that have exactly the median number of mutations tends to 1 as n goes to infinity, so the fitness distribution is really converging to a point mass rather than converging to a Gaussian. So the question that motivated this work was whether we could formulate a population model involving selection in which we can rigorously establish that the uh, distribution of the fitness levels of individuals in the population converges to a Gaussian distribution. Now, for the parameter ranges in uh, these papers uh, indicated here, the obstacle is that the process retains a sort of discrete flavor in which an individual mutation can have a significant effect on the overall evolution of the population. Suppose, however, we consider the case of much faster mutation rates so that each individual acquires many mutations within a fairly short period of time, but each individual mutation has only a very small effect on the individual's fitness. Well, in this case, the fitness of an individual changes over time like a random walk as individuals acquire more and more mutations, and this random walk should be well approximated by Brownian motion. And I should mention that this idea that uh, each individual mutation has only a small effect on fitness is related to the so-called infinitesimal model in population genetics, which in some sense goes back over 100 years. Quite recently, Barton, Etheridge, and Weber did some mathematical work on this model, as well as providing an extensive survey in their paper of the related biology literature. So this leads to the following model, which we're going to study, which is based on branching Brownian motion. So we begin with some configuration of particles on the real line at time zero. And we want to think of each particle as being an individual in a population, and the position of the particle corresponds to the fitness of the individual. We assume that each particle independently moves according to one-dimensional Brownian motion, with a drift to the left uh, of minus rho. We'll assume that each particle dies at rate one, and a particle at the location x splits into two particles at the rate one plus beta times x. So particles with higher fitness are more likely to split into two. That is, they're more likely to have offspring. Now, if x is less than minus one over beta, we can't have the birth rate being negative, so we'll set the birth rate to zero and increase the death rate so that the difference between the birth and death rates is always exactly beta times x. And in fact, as long as the difference between the birth rate and the death rate is this linear function of x, there's quite a bit of flexibility in the exact choices of the functions b of x and d of x. In fact, uh, our results will hold as long as the death rate is uniformly bounded below by a positive constant, and as long as the birth rate is uniformly abounded above uh, for x less than or equal to 
1 over beta. And for this model, we will be able to show that under certain conditions on the parameters and on the initial configuration of particles, if we wait for a sufficiently long time, the empirical distribution of the locations of the particles in this process will be approximately a Gaussian distribution. And of course, I'll state a much more precise version of this result later on. Now, before I discuss uh, how we go about studying this process, I want to briefly mention some other related work. Our model was studied previously by Neher and Halaschek, and in fact, most of our results were established in their paper using non-rigorous arguments. Also, the idea of modeling populations undergoing selection using branching Brownian motion is certainly not new. That idea goes back at least to this paper of Brunet, Derrida, Mueller, and Mounier in 2006. Uh, they considered a model in which the particles start out on the positive real line. They split into two particles at rate one, and the particles are killed when they reach the origin. So that gives a very different way of modeling selection in which all individuals have the same fertility rate, but individuals are killed when their fitness drops below a threshold. That model leads to very different behavior because the particles tend to cluster near zero. And so we don't get anything close to a Gaussian distribution for the uh, fitness levels of individuals in the population. Also in her PhD thesis, Erin Beckman considered branching Brownian motion with an inhomogeneous branching rate. She was also uh, motivated in part by potential applications to populations involving selection. Her work focuses on studying the process over a significantly shorter time scale than the one that we're going to be considering in this talk. Now there's also been some uh, purely mathematical work on branching Brownian motion with an inhomogeneous branching rate, uh, not necessarily motivated by applications to population genetics. In 2009, uh, John Harris and Simon Harris considered uh, a branching Brownian motion process in which there's no drift, no deaths, and particles at x branch at a rate which is some constant times the absolute value of x to the pth power. So then if we let r sub t be the position of the rightmost particle at time t, that is the maximum of the positions of all the particles at time t, uh, they showed that if p was between zero and two, uh, the, right the position of the rightmost particle grows like t to the power two over two minus p. If p is equal to two, the position of the rightmost particle grows exponentially. And if p is strictly greater than two, the process explodes in finite time because as particles get farther to the right, they keep wanting to branch faster and faster. More recently, Beristicki, Brunet, Harris, Harris, and Roberts obtained some sharper results about this process, and their proofs used techniques that were based on large deviations methods. Now, it turns out that these large deviations methods are not powerful enough to prove the results that we're going for in this talk. However, they do provide some useful insights into how, how our process behaves. So next I want to look at what these large deviations heuristics predict for the behavior of our branching Brownian motion process, even though we'll ultimately have to prove these results using different methods. So the starting point for these large deviations techniques is Schilder's theorem for Brownian motion, which I've stated here in a very rough form. Suppose capital T is a large time, and f is a function from the interval from zero to t to the real numbers. And then if we start a, if we take a Brownian motion with a drift of minus rho and start it from f of zero, then the probability that this Brownian particle stays reasonably close to the function f until time t is approximately given by this expression here. Now to adapt this result, for branching Brownian motion, we need to apply the many to one lemma. Recall that the difference between the birth rate and the death rate for a particle at x is given by beta times x. And we want to find the expected number of particles 
in the branching Brownian motion process at time t, for which the trajectory of the ancestor of this particle stays close to the function f. And to do that, we'll start with the probability that a single Brownian particle stays close to the function f. And then the many to one lemma tells us that we have to multiply by this factor to account for the births and deaths. And so in this case, uh, the factor is the exponential of the integral from zero to t of the difference between the birth rate and the death rate for the particle at time u. And as long as the particle is tracking close to the function f, that should be beta times f of u. So this formula gives us the expected number of particles in the branching Brownian motion that stay relatively close to the function f. Now the actual number of particles that stay close to f should be reasonably comparable to the expected number, provided that this integral, when we evaluate it up to time little t, is non-negative for all little t between zero and capital T. If this integral goes negative, then most likely no particles are able to follow the trajectory past that point. And so the number of particles that follow that trajectory will most likely be zero in a typical realization of the process, even if the expected number is large. So now let's suppose we start with one, uh, let, let, let's consider this function, uh, f, this constant function f. So f of u is equal to rho squared over two beta for all u between zero and t. And in that case, one can see that the integrand here is always zero. So now let's suppose we start with one particle at the location rho squared over two beta. So one thing that can happen, of course, is that the process could just quickly die out. And the large deviations heuristics don't really capture that possibility very well. But suppose that doesn't happen, then this formula suggests that there should be roughly a constant number of particles that stay close to rho squared over two beta all the way up to time t. Now, had we chosen a number here that was larger than rho squared over two beta, the number of such particles, uh, that the number of particles are staying at that level would exponentially increase because the branching rate here would be dominating the drift. On the other hand, had we chosen a smaller uh, number rather than rho squared over two beta, uh, then, uh, then uh, no particles would be able to stay at that level uh, if we started a particle from that point because the integrand here would be negative. And so starting with one particle around rho squared over two beta seems like a, a reasonably good idea if what we want to do is to model a population whose size is going to be reasonably stable over time, uh, just like in the discrete population model that I mentioned in which the population size was fixed. So let's imagine that we do start with one particle at rho squared over two beta, and then the expected number of particles that will be near the location y at time t is roughly given by this expression here. So we saw on the previous slide that that expression approximates the number of particles that will follow this trajectory f sub y until time capital T. And here we are choosing the function f sub y so that it maximizes this integral subject to the constraints that the function starts at zero, or rather starts at rho squared over two beta. It ends at y, and the integral up to time little t stays non-negative for all little t between time zero and time capital T. So that is in some sense the optimal path that a particle would want to follow in order to reach y at time t, and large deviations heuristics tell us that most particles should follow close to that optimal path. Now it's possible to solve this optimization problem. We can find the function fy that maximizes this integral subject to these constraints, and we can evaluate that expression. And what we get is that if capital T is sufficiently large, the number of particles near y at time t should be approximately e to the g of y, where g of y is given by this expression here. And because g prime of zero is zero, while the second derivative of g is minus beta over rho, this formula suggests 
that the, distribu that the uh, empirical distribution of the locations of the particles at time t should be approximately Gaussian with a mean of zero and a variance of rho over beta. Now we also get some insight by looking at the trajectories that these particles should typically follow. So remember, we expect the mean of the Gaussian distribution of particles at time t to be near zero. And particles that are near zero at time t, well, their ancestors should typically follow this trajectory f sub zero. So that means that the ancestors of most particles that are alive at time t should have stayed close to rho squared over two beta up until the time t minus rho over beta, at which time the particles J start Jason. To move closer to the origin according to this quadratic function here. Jason, I have a question for you. Yes. From Nathanael. So why isn't the distribution exponential g of y? Uh, why isn't it exponential g of y? Well, in some sense, this does give you the distribution. But if you change, basically, uh, you know, if you change y by very much, then there are very few particles out there at all. And so what we're really doing is looking at a Taylor expansion of this in the neighborhood of zero. And so we're using a, a quadratic uh, approximation to this in the neighborhood of zero. And then we get something that's like e to the minus a quadratic and that's looking Gaussian. So uh, th this full function g should give us some information way out on the tails, uh, but just this information about the derivatives at zero is giving you where the bulk of the particles are going to be located. All right, that's good, thanks. Okay, uh, so this, uh, this uh, picture here gives us some uh, insight into the scale on which we need to think about this process. So we see, for example, that uh, at any given time, we expect the particles with the highest fitness to be close to rho squared over two beta. And furthermore, we expect that it should take approximately a time rho over beta for the Gaussian shape to emerge from the initial configuration of particles. Now we can also get some insight into the conditions on the parameters that are required for this picture to be valid. Because the uh, standard deviation of the Gaussian particle distribution is the square root of rho over beta, we expect most particles to be within a distance of the order, uh, the square root of rho over beta of the origin. And so for these heuristics to make sense, uh, rho squared over two beta, which is where the very fittest particles are located, should be much larger than that. And that's equivalent to the condition that rho cubed is much larger than beta. Furthermore, we want to be considering fairly weak selection so that beta times x, which is the difference between the birth and death rates for a particle located at x, should be small even when the particle uh, x is uh, one of the fittest particles located at rho squared over two beta. And that means uh, that we need rho to be much less than one. Now, unfortunately, as I mentioned earlier, uh, these large deviations heuristics are not powerful enough to yield uh, rigorous proofs of these results. And so we're going to need to establish these results using other methods. So now we want to think about uh, how we can uh, start to work to uh, establish some rigorous results for this process. And a natural place to start is by calculating the density for the process. So let's define p sub t of x comma y, such that if we start with one particle at the location x at time zero, the expected number of particles in the set A at time t is given by the integral of p t of x y over the set A. And we'll let q t of x y be the corresponding density for the process in which there's no drift. So now an application of the many to one lemma tells us that the density qt of xy is given by this expression here. If we had no uh, births and deaths, then of course this would just be the Gaussian distribution for Brownian motion started at x. But in order to account for the births and deaths, uh, basically what we have to do is multiply this factor here, 
which is the expected value of the exponential of this integral of a Brownian bridge from x to y, and we multiply the Gaussian density by that additional factor. And uh, ex uh, expectations of Brownian functionals like this can be found, for example, in the book by Borodin and Salmanen. And so we get this reasonably nice expression for the density qt of xy. And then to incorporate the drift, we introduce a Gersonov transformation to see that pt of xy can be written by, uh, can be written as uh, in a closed form expression in this way here. Now, once we have this formula for the density, it's possible to calculate moments of various functionals of the process. So let's let n of t be the number of particles alive at time t, and we'll let x1 of t, x2 of t, and so on, be the positions of the particles at time t. And so then if we start the branching Brownian motion with one particle at x, we can calculate the expected value of this sum, where a particle at y contributes f of y to the sum, simply by integrating the function f with respect to this density. And then, for example, we could take f to be the indicator of the set A in order to come up with the expected number of particles at time t that are in the set A. And that's useful if we want to work to, towards understanding the empirical distribution of the particle locations at time t. Now, we'll also need to be able to calculate second moments in order to control the fluctuations. And for this, we can use a technique that goes back to this work of Ikeda Nagasawa and Watanabe in 1969. So when we expand out this square here, we get a sum over pairs of particles. And in order for there to be particles at y1 and y2 at time t, there has to be a branching event at some time s where the trajectories of those two particles diverged. So that means we need a particle that goes from x to some location z in time s. Uh, then we need a particle to go from z to y1 in time t minus s. And then the other particle produced by that branching event needs to go from z to y2 in time t minus s. So then if we integrate over the position s of the branching, the, uh, or, or, or rather the time s of the branching, the position z of the branching, and the positions y1 and y2 of the two particles, we are able to calculate this second moment. Now, unfortunately, these moment calculations tend to be dominated by rare events in which a particle moves very far to the right, which allows it to have an unusually large number of offspring that survive. And when that happens, the moments don't actually capture very well the typical behavior of the process. And so to understand better what happens during a typical realization of the process, we need to apply a truncation argument. That is, we fix some large positive number L and we kill particles when they reach the level L. So let's let QTL of XY be the density for our process when we remove the drift and when we kill particles when they reach the level L. Then Kolmogorov's forward equations tell us that the density needs to satisfy this partial differential equation here. If we only had the first term on the right-hand side, this would just be the heat equation, which the density of Brownian motion would satisfy. But we also have this second term to account for the births and deaths. Recall again that the difference between the birth rate and the death rate for a particle at y is beta times y. Now it turns out that one can solve this partial differential equation using spectral methods. So let's look for a solution of the form e to the lambda t times h of y. And then h, the function h has to satisfy this ordinary differential equation here. And because of this y times h of y term, this equation is just a simple transformation of Airy's differential equation, and the solutions will involve Airy functions. So one can solve this equation and work out the density QTL of xy. That in fact was actually done in this much earlier paper of Salmanen in 1988. And then we can again apply the Gersonov transformation 
to reintroduce the drift, and we end up with this formula here for PTL of XY, which is the density for our process with, uh, with the drift included and where particles are killed at L. So here, gamma 1, gamma 2, and so on denote the zeros of the Airy function, which all lie on the negative real line. And phi k of x is the Airy function evaluated at 2 beta to the 1 third times L minus x plus gamma k. So what we really have here is a formula for the density pt L of xy uh, in terms of an eigenfunction expansion involving Airy functions. Now we're going to let L be rho squared over 2 beta minus 2 beta to the minus 1 third times the largest zero of the Airy function. So that's the level at which we're going to kill particles. And we're making this choice so that when k is equal to 1, this exponent here vanishes. Had we chosen a smaller value of L, uh, this whole process would die out exponentially, and we would just be killing too many particles of, at the level L and not learning anything about the original process. On the other hand, if we chose a larger value of L, then the leading term here would blow up exponentially, and we would end up with the expected number of particles increasing exponentially over time, and the truncation argument would fail. So uh, recall from the large deviations heuristics that typically the uh, fittest particles were located near rho squared over 2 beta. So then recalling that uh, gamma 1 is negative, what we're doing here is we're killing particles when they get just a little bit above that level. Now, when t is large, the k equals 1 term will dominate this sum because all the other terms are decreasing exponentially. And so when t is large, we can approximate this formula here by its leading term and get this simpler approximation to the density PTL of xy. So here is the formula for PTL of xy, the approximation that we had on the previous slide. And there are two things that I want to observe about this density formula. So the first is that if we start with one particle at x, then the expected number of particles alive at some future time is roughly proportional to e to the rho x times this airy function. And in fact, if we define z of t by summing over all particles at time t, e to the rho times xi of t times this airy function, this process z is actually a martingale when particles are killed at L. And so z of t turns out to be a natural measure of the size of the process at time t, because it's z of t that predicts how many particles will be alive a long time into the future. Now, the second thing to observe about this formula is that the density near y is roughly proportional to e to the minus rho y times this Airy function. Now, it's well known that when z is large, the Airy function evaluated at z is asymptotically z to the minus 1 quarter times e to the minus 2 thirds z to the minus 3 halves. And if we plug these asymptotics into this formula here, we get that the density of particles near y is roughly proportional to e to the g of y, where g of y is given by this expression here. And this, of course, is the same formula g that we had previously obtained from the large deviations heuristic. So now our overall strategy for studying this process then consists of two main parts. So first, we want to understand the behavior of the particles that are very close to L, very close to the right edge of the process. So for this, we're going to consider the process in which particles are killed when they reach L. We then show that particles do not reach L too often, so that the truncation is not having a severe effect on the overall behavior of the process. We use first moment calculations to establish that the density of particles near Y is roughly proportional to e to the minus rho Y times this Airy function. And then we use second moment bounds to control the fluctuations, thereby establishing that the configuration of particles near the right edge, in some sense, stays relatively stable over time. 
Now, of course, most particles at any given time are not near the right edge. We are uh, most interested in the bulk of the distribution of particles, and most of the particles, as we saw from the large deviations heuristic, should be closer to zero. So to study these particles, what we'll do is to first recall that the particles that are near the origin at time t should be descended from ancestors that are close to L at time t minus rho over beta. That's something we saw from the large deviations heuristics. And so uh, at that time, the particles near L should be in this relatively stable configuration that we discussed before. And so starting from that configuration of particles at time t minus rho over beta, we can then do additional first and second moment calculations to establish that the empirical distribution of the locations of the particles at time t is approximately Gaussian with a mean of zero and a variance of rho over beta. And for these calculations, we are able to use the uh, original density pt of xy without killing for the first moment calculation, but we still need a truncation argument to handle the second moment bound. So now we're able to state our main theorem for the Gaussian shape for the distribution of particles. Now, because we want to prove a limit theorem, we need to consider a sequence of branching Brownian motion processes indexed by n. Now, we'll need some assumptions on the initial configuration of particles. Uh, and the conditions that we need are the ones that were predicted by the large deviations heuristics. So we need that rho cubed over beta is going to infinity and that rho by itself is going to zero. Now we also need some conditions on the initial configuration of particles. We'll assume that the initial configuration is such that Zn of zero, that's our measure of the size of the process at time zero, is of the order beta to the one, one third over rho cubed times e to the rho times l. That's basically ensuring that the population is roughly of the right size to behave in the way that we claim. And then we also need this more technical condition here. If we define yn of t to be this sum, so that a particle at x contributes e to the rho times x to the sum, then we need rho squared times e to the minus rho l times yn of zero to be converging in probability to zero. And what this condition is mostly doing is it's ensuring that, the, that we don't have a a uh, small number of particles at time zero that are producing almost all of the descendants at later times. So there needs to be a, su a substantial set of particles at time zero that are contributing to the process a long time into the future. If we really just started with one particle or five particles at time zero, it's very likely that they would all just die out right away. So now uh, for uh, a positive time t, we're going to define this random probability measure here. So for a particle located at x, we're going to place a unit mass at the location x times the square root of beta over rho, and then we normalize by the number of particles to get a probability measure. So zeta n of t here represents the empirical distribution of the particle locations at time t scaled in space. So then if we let t sub n be a times rho over beta, where a is a positive number that's bigger than one, then uh, these random probability measures zeta n of tn, which are measuring the empirical distribution of the particle locations, are converging in distribution as n goes to infinity to the standard normal distribution. And that gives us our Gaussian shape for the distribution of particles. So this result tells us that the empirical distribution I have a question, of particles uh, the, after a sufficiently long time is approximately normal with a mean of zero and a variance of rho over beta. Uh, Jason, can class, you go back to the theorem, please? Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. Uh, can you go back to the theorem? There was a question. Yes. Uh, what's the purpose of A? What's the purpose of A? So the point is that we have a, a result here uh, about the configuration of particles on a certain time scale. So uh, we're, we're, we basically understand uh, the distribution of particles uh, at, at times which are of the order 
rho over beta. And so we're basically saying that the time at which we're looking at the process should be some constant times rho over beta. All right. And the okay. constant has to be at least one, because remember for, from the large deviations heuristic, if we start with uh, a particle or so near the right edge, it's going to take time rho over beta for those, uh, the descendants of those particles to make their way towards the origin. So that the A is just putting us on the right time scale. All right. Thank you. All right, so uh, we have this, uh, we have this uh, Gaussian distribution, uh, normal with mean of zero and a variance of rho over beta. And at first glance, this may seem to be different from the conjecture that I stated at the beginning of the talk, because at the beginning of the talk, we said that the fitness distribution should evolve like a Gaussian traveling wave. But that's really just a question of how we interpret the drift, because our model is essentially equivalent to one in which there's no drift, but that at time t, the difference between the birth rate and the death rate for a particle located at x is given by beta times x minus rho times t. And for this process, the empirical distribution of particles after a large time t will be approximately normal with a mean of rho times t and a variance of rho over beta. And so the drift rho is really measuring the speed at which the Gaussian traveling wave advances. For mathematical purposes, it's convenient to subtract off the drift so that the branching rate and the death rate uh, only depend on the position of the particle and not on time. But we can, in fact, interpret rho as the speed at which the traveling wave is advancing forward. And with this interpretation, our results are consistent with Fisher's fundamental theorem of natural selection. Fisher postulated that the rate at which the fitness of a population increases should be equal to the variance of the distribution of the fitness levels of individuals in the population. So for our process, if a particle moves a, a distance one to the right, its fitness increases by beta. So the rate at which the fitness of the population is increasing is really beta times rho. And the variance of the fitness distribution is beta squared times the variance of the empirical distribution of the particle locations, which is rho over beta, and once again, we get beta times rho. Now, this still may seem like cheating because somehow rho was in the model uh, to start with, but from our methods, one can see uh, that uh, if we start the process from the initial uh, configuration satisfying the conditions that were indicated, then in the long run, the number of particles in the system should be roughly beta to the one third over rho cubed times this exponential. And this formula establishes a relationship among rho, beta, and n. So mathematically, it was convenient to start from rho and beta and then derive the number of particles, uh, the number of particles n that can be sustained in the system in equilibrium but one could also start with the population size n and with the parameter beta that measures the strength of the selective forces acting on the population and then use this equation here to solve for rho. Now the previous result establishes that most particles are indeed within a distance of the order the square root of rho over beta of the origin. However, we also have a result that describes the configuration of particles that are very close to the right edge, in particular the particles that are within order beta to the minus one-third of L. And it's important to understand uh, these particles because uh, these are the particles that will have descendants alive a long time into the future. So for this result, we make the same assumptions on the parameters and on the initial conditions that we made before, uh, but this time, for all positive times t, we'll define this random probability measure psi n of t. So if we have a particle at the location x, we will assign a mass of e to the rho times x. So fitter particles are assigned higher mass. So that will place more of the density on the particles close to L. And we will place that mass at the location 2 beta to the 1 third times L minus x. So the farther below L the particle is located, the farther above zero the mass is placed. And then we normalize to get a probability measure. 
So again, we let t sub n be a times rho over beta. This time a can be any positive number. Uh, and then the result says that uh, psi n of t n, these random probability measures, are converging in distribution as n tends to infinity to the probability distribution rho, where rho is the probability measure on the positive real line whose density is proportional to the portion of the area function to the right of the largest zero. So essentially the area function is telling us something about the, uh, about the configuration of the, of the very fittest particles in the, in the population. And I see there's a question uh, in the chat, uh, Nathaniel asks, is this the best we can hope for in terms of the parameter A? Uh, and if, we're, if you're going to do it this way, the answer is yes. You can't get this for, uh, for other values of A. Uh, we do believe that it's possible uh, to get this. For example, in this case, A really shouldn't have to be a constant multiple of rho over beta. It should be enough for it to be much larger than beta to the minus 2 thirds, although because of the way our proof is structured, the result that we get is, is a little bit worse than, uh, than what should be the best possible. Okay, so I wanna end by uh, mentioning some possible topics uh, for uh, future work. So first in any population model, it's natural to ask how to describe the genealogy of the population. That is, if we take a sample of individuals from the population at some time and trace the ancestral lines of these individuals backwards in time, we want to understand what coalescent process describes uh, the process by which these lineages merge as we trace them back in time. And it turns out that the uh, calculations we've made uh, suggest very strongly that, uh, that the genealogy of the population should be described by a process called the bolthausen snitman coalescent, which is what was predicted previously by Neher and Halischek. And indeed, we expect to be able to prove this result by using arguments very similar to those used by Julian Beristicki, Nathaniel Beristicki, and myself uh, to study the case of branching Brownian motion in which every particle has the same birth rate, but particles are killed when they reach the origin. As I mentioned before, the fitness distribution looks very different for those two models, but we believe that the genealogy is the same. Uh, another direction for future work is to return to the discrete population models that I mentioned at the beginning of the talk. We believe that the results that we've established for branching Brownian motion with an inhomogeneous branching rate should also apply to those discrete population models as long as the mutation rate is sufficiently large and the selective benefit, uh, the fitness benefit resulting from an individual mutation is sufficiently small. And because the convergence of random walk to Brownian motion is fairly robust, relying only on independence and a second moment condition, we believe that our results for branching Brownian motion should apply to a fairly wide range of discrete population models. In particular, the correspondence should hold even if the mutations are deleterious or if the, uh, fitness, if the change in fitness resulting from a mutation is a random variable. Proving rigorous results for these discrete population models may be quite challenging, however, uh, because one loses a lot of independence when working with a population of fixed size. And I'll stop there, thank you. Thank you, Jason. Uh, I guess now is the time for a full question, uh, either on the chat or you can raise your hand and we will, uh, we will, um, Unmute you. So, any questions for Jason? <laughs> also, uh, we're going to have breakout rooms uh, so you can ask more technical questions or just discuss. I guess, okay, if, if there's no more questions, ah, let's see. I think Nathanael has a, a question. Oh yeah, Nathanael has one. What is the geneal genealogical time scale? Uh, yes, yeah, so the, the genealogical time scale is uh, basically this rho over beta uh, time scale that we've been talking about. 
Uh, and I would expect a result that's uh, a little bit different uh, to what we, we had in the, in, in the case of branching Brownian motion uh, with particles absorbed at the origin in the sense that uh, if you sample the particles from some time, there's going to be this initial time period uh, of length rho over beta when there's not going to be uh, any merging at all. And then the Bolthaus and Snitman mergers are going to start uh, after that point. Uh, so that's similar to what uh, happened in, uh, with the discrete population model uh, that I studied in the, the paper from 2017 that I mentioned earlier, but it is a, a little bit different from the other branching Brownian motion model uh, that we're familiar with. Uh -huh. uh, um, so the questions about the, the density, uh, the convergence, in what sense does it converge to the Gaussian, the empirical density? Yeah, so, so the, nature of the, the nature of the convergence. So we have the empirical, uh, the, the empirical distribution of the particles at time uh, t sub n. And so we view, that as, uh, we view that as a random variable taking its values in the space of probability measures. And then it's just a weak convergence in the sense of, of finite dimensional distributions for random mm -hmm. variables uh, taking, its values in, taking their values in that uh, space of probability measures. So I'd, I'd say it's a, a kind of weak convergence. All right. There's some more uh, technical questions uh, that you might see on the chats from uh, Samuel Johnston. Um, yeah. So uh, Samuel asks about the, uh, so can the, can the process forwards in time uh, be described by a continuous state branching process? And if you look at uh, this process Z here, uh, we believe that this process Z would in fact uh, converge to a continuous state branching process if you look at it on the right scale. I see. Are there any uh, other distribution than Gaussian that non-trivial that could, that you know one can expect, or or Gaussian is really the fixed point that uh, in biology you would expect. Uh, could, okay, could you get other dis distributions other than Gaussian? So, I mean, like non trivial, you, yeah, non degenerate. Yeah, so I mean, I, I think there's some kind of universality going on in the sense that, you know, if you have this e to a function and that function can be, you know, if, 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 if it's, you know, you, you can do the Taylor series near the maximum and get the, the quadratic, uh, that aspect should be universal. But there are certainly, uh, so, so I would expect a wide range of models to have a Gaussian shape, uh, but of course there are examples of models that don't. For example, as I mentioned, the branching Brownian motion where particles are killed at the origin, that leads to a very different shape. You have a, a right. cluster of particles. Mm -hmm. Most of the particles stay within order one of the origin, and then there's a kind of a long right tail. Uh, so that's very much uh, non-Gaussian. Andres has a question. I guess Andres, uh, you can yeah, unmute. Yeah, just, just a, a quickie. Um, so, so I'm just looking at your slides. You, you said you expect similar stuff to hold for um, other discrete population models. Yes. Do, do you mean do you mean like if if I replace the Brownian motion with drift by another diffusion? I mean, surely that would corrupt all the calculations somehow. Right, right. So, so what I'm referring to here is we have this model where we just have individuals that acquire uh, mutations over time. So it would sort of be like, if you look at the fitness of each particle, uh, it should evolve like a continuous time random walk, right? You wait an exponential time for the next mutation, and then the mutation changes your fitness. Yeah. And I think if we have enough mutations and each one changes it only a little bit, that random walk should converge to Brownian motion. And that's where we think there might be some universality. I see. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, Nathanael also wants to ask a question by Mike. Nathanael. Hi. So I wanted to ask you, 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 your choice of uh, birth and death rates, they are uh, so such that the difference B minus D is, is linear. And I guess that allows you to solve exactly a certain uh, ordinary differential equation, which leads to the area function, right? Yes. 
So my question is whether you expect some some universality if, if you cancel the uh, ODE explicitly. So if you have some other power function, um, you know, what, what, what can we expect in terms of universality here? Yeah, so I, I think if you had some other power function that would change things quite a bit. For example, in the work of, uh, uh, you know, th th there was this other work that I mentioned uh, before on this, uh, process. I'm forgetting all the names of the authors with five authors uh, here. Beristicki, Brunet, Harris, Harris, and Roberts, uh, following up on work of, of Harris and Harris. And so they were looking at, uh, you know, different powers, and that did change the behavior quite a bit. So uh, I think the linear uh, rate would be kind of special uh, in that sense. I, I, I don't think you could do things that are wildly nonlinear and get similar results. But, but I, su I suppose you could fit even the, the branching Brownian motion with uh, fixed drift and absorption at zero in this framework by, by allowing some sort of step function, by making it a step function with uh, jumping from infinity to zero. Is that, is, that, is that what it would correspond to? Uh... So when particles are killed exactly when they hit zero, this means the, the difference is something like minus infinity. Or... Or plus infinity. Yeah, I, I would have to think about that. I'm I'm not sure exactly how how to how to fit that into the to the same framework. I mean, when we have this equation, of course, uh, yeah. So here we we have this equation for the density. Uh, if we have the branching Brownian motion in which the you know in which we have the absorption at zero, but we don't have the different birth and death rates uh, outside of zero. You just get a simpler equation here, and that gives you, uh, you know, something where instead of having these area functions, we have the sine and cosine functions, and that's where those sine and cosine functions in the earlier branching Brownian motion paper uh, came from. So that's uh, a bit of a, of a correspondence, but I, I don't know anything beyond that at this point. So it might be that even though the state of the fitness distribution might depend on a specific model, maybe the genealogy is always a Baltas and Slipman and there's always some universality there. That might be quite, quite neat. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I, I don't, well, I, I don't know how, yeah, I, I don't know how universal that is outside the, these two kind of collections of, of models. All right, I suggest that, um, we uh, clap and we thank uh, Jason. So I'm going to unmute everybody. And uh, so I think everybody's unmuted now. Thank you so much for uh, Sarah and, and Jason for.